uh, in fact, one of the uh, giants of architecture of the last half century, Harry Cobb, a founding partner of Pay Cobb Freed and Partners, um, and the designer of many, many uh, significant and gigantic buildings around the world and Boston. He's also a fellow, like Ted, of the Massachusetts Historical Society, also a Lampin alumnus, and the trifecta. He's also uh, the, the grand nephew of Edmund March Wright, Mr. Cobb. Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to focus on, uh, not uh, on the lampoon, but on one aspect of uh, uh, Edmund March Wheelwright's career uh, that is not so much known, celebrated today as I think it perhaps should be. That is to say, his service as city architect from 1891 to 1895, a four-year period during which, as you can see here, he designed and got built 42 buildings in a four-year period for the city of Boston. It, it's, uh, for any of you who know about the practice of architecture, that's an extraordinary achievement. Uh, not only that, but he was, his work was highly respected, not only for the quality of design, but for the uh, skill of the management of the whole process his buildings, and uh, a very large monograph about his work as city architect was produced in 1898, uh, edited with uh, a, a very interesting introduction by Francis Chandler, uh, in which he particularly praised uh, not only the quality of design, but the whole, uh, it's not easy to to be an architect for a public agency and to be an architect for the city of Boston was tough. As a matter of fact, uh, there hasn't been one before or since. <laughs> uh, but he was much admired for that work. And by the way, in that monograph, uh, there are also detailed uh, cost figures for all these buildings. And I can tell you that of the 21 schools, all of which are listed and illustrated, the average price was between $2.40 and $2.60 a square foot. Quite. So I'm just going to sh show you a few of these. I'm not going to talk about them, but just to give you a sense of the range, as, as uh, Sam Van Den was saying, the range of his, uh, uh, of his ability to uh, uh, not only uh, uh, borrow from precedent, but to reinterpret it in ways that were appropriate to the programs he was dealing with. This is a series of schools, mechanics, art, I think one of the most, I don't know how many of these are still extant. I haven't done my research, I'm afraid. Uh, but those, some of you, if they do exist, you recognize them. And of each one, I'm showing an overall view and a detail because, again, what you can sense is that the there's a real uh, quality of craft in these buildings. And that's also something very important uh, in public works, to, uh, to be able to uh, not only design the building, but to succeed in getting it built with the quality of craft that these buildings have is quite, quite extraordinary. And you can see the variety. I chose these just to represent the variety of sort of uh, stylistic uh, uh, choices that he made. There's a, that's the only interior in the whole book, by the way. Then there are other buildings, uh, Boston City Hospital, quite remarkable arcade. And here you begin to see in some of these buildings, the, uh, the wit of the man we knew in our family as Uncle Ned Wheelwright. We never knew him because he died before we were born, but uh, he was very fondly remembered by his sister, my grandmother. 
Uh, notice, for example, that wonderful detail. <laughs> no, no postmodernist could have done it better. Do you think that had a curative effect? <laughs> uh, that's the fire department probably and that does still exist and I think it's probably the best known building of that period. Some of the smaller buildings are quite charming. And, uh, and in my view, uh, particularly interesting because I see a kind of contemporaneity in this. This is not just borrowing from ancient styles here. You see him playing with things that were very contemporary at the time. Very, for example, large surfaces of, of brick with uh, uh, that was, there's the famous headhouse pier, the exact opposite of, uh, uh, but the, this one, I, I think this is a very fine little building. Again, the, uh, the composition, the quality of uh, proportions in the openings, uh, and, the, and the restraint, excuse me? Are you talking about this one? Yes, yes. Yeah. It's beautiful. And I don't know, does this building still exist? I don't think so. It burned. So that's remarkable. So there is, uh, you know, I would say that his buildings, when you take the whole range of them, there is uh, obviously a kind of level of scholarship involved in his understanding of historic styles. But there's also a real uh, sensibility, which I think particularly in his smaller buildings is uh, very much his own. This one, I don't know whether this exists either, but I, isn't that really charming? Does anyone know whether that still exists? No. Mm -hmm. uh, these are all taken from that one monograph that was published in 1898. And everyone knows these, which do so. <laughs> I walked through these for many, many years before I knew that they were designed by Edmund Wheelwright. And finally, uh, not many people know, this is the only building in this large monograph that was not built, the only one shown only in renderings. Uh, he was commissioned to design a new city hall in his last year as city architect. Uh, as you can see, it was going to be placed next to the state house. Uh, in my view, uh, I think that he was struggling a bit with this, with the sheer scale of this and the monumentality of it. Uh, uh, to me, it doesn't, it's not yet resolved, uh, although you can see very clearly some of the precedents. Uh, there's per Claude Perrault's great uh, east front of the Louvre, that it's clear that Wheelwright had that in mind. Uh, and uh, that's, so that's uh, just a glimpse of his work as city architect.